I want to see if you'll remember exactly what this is. Wow. Black Sabbath, it was <laughs> at 6.30 p.m., produced by Avalon, Great Western Forum, January 8th. Looks like 1899, but it's 1999. 1999. <laughs> 1999. Wow. 99. This is when uh, Black Sabbath uh, Pantera was opening, playing, uh, and we were the uh, we were the opening slot, and Pantera was direct support, if I'm not mistaken. Uh huh. I think so. Was it? Okay, so this was my first System of a Down experience. Wow. My parents took me to a Black Sabbath concert in 1999 when I was a little kid, as most traditional Armenian parents do. <laughs> and so we get there, and then on this huge stage, we see a gigantic Armenian flag. Right. So imagine us. I mean, at that time, there there was really, Armenian wasn't exactly a trendy thing in Los Angeles. Nobody really knew about us yeah. at the time. So we're like, oh, it must be a mistake. It's probably a Colombian flag. It's just upside down. They made a mistake. Right. And then you come out with your big hair <laughs> yeah and the rest of the guys wow. come out and we start hearing kind of like little armenian melodies even in the music and we're like no this is this is really this seems to be the real thing it's not a mistake so of course then we go and we research and we're like who are these guys we get your album right away and then i hear sugar on the radio your first single on the radio so is that the first time that you're dead even did yeah, you, like yeah. your dad hadn't seen it. No, so they just came out to a black Black Sabbath. We concert. all, yeah, we just came to a Black that's Sabbath rad. concert, so oh, that I was just a that. huge surprise. That's, that's from then on, we knew each other, obviously. So yeah, I didn't know that that was the the opening. That's cool. Yeah, well, we're like, we have to know who these guys are because I mean, that was just so surreal. That was a really surreal experience for us. So my parents were at that show. Oh, really? And. And I remember it really well because, first of all, they loved uh, they loved Black Sabbath, but they really loved Pantera as well, which is, for my parents, and they're in their 80s now, yeah. for them to actually like Pantera, I was like, really? Are you just saying, you know, like I could have, that didn't, I didn't understand that. But besides that, I think my dad really had a great time because a woman flashed him. Oh. Right, <laughs> turned around and and flashed him in the seats, which oh my <laughs> god, this is happening! Like she know? targeted him specifically. Oh, no, probably right. just turned around and you know, yeah, flashed him. They're like, wow, this is a real party. Uh, wow, that brings back so many memories. Wow, that you. is so amazing. That's cool. So it's amazing that you kept that. You know what's Amazing. funny is I thought, oh, it'll be so I fun if anything. I bring this. And yeah, I thought it would be so fun if I bring this, but I really was not thinking I was going to find it. And somehow it was just right at the top of my ticket list with some of the old shows we went to. So it was That's so perfect. Cool. It's like, I have to show this to him. And I wanted to tell you this story last time when we all went out. And then I was like, no, 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 no. I'm going to save this. Save this. Yeah. <laughs> right occasion. It seems like with System of a Down, music, politics, culture, it was intertwined from the very beginning. What was your mindset when you started the band? What exactly was that like something that you really co made a conscious decision to do? Or how did that, how did that I, happen? I don't think we consciously did anything but play the music that came to us. You know, um, there was no conscious, uh, rec you know, design of trying to integrate socio-political things that that was more you know kind of what i just did as as an activist because i was an activist before i was a musician yeah and uh so you know and 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 all the other stuff too culturally i mean we're all armenian it just kind of happened that way so it became our you know it, it became a part of you know it, it is a part of who we are it was always a part of who we were and that was unique because there wasn't any of you know there was no Armenian bands at the time in, yeah. in the U.S. Um, or anywhere in the world as far as I knew. But uh, I think one thing that also made it different is we didn't mind. I mean, there's been a lot of different artists throughout history, Armenian artists, actors and whatnot, who um, shied away from being Armenian hmm. as, as a way of kind of, um, you know, mixing in, you know, and making it yeah. more comfortable for people, you know, uh, changing their names. Last or, names. You know, not, no, they they never denied that they were Armenian, but they didn't really advertise it. Yeah. And I think in our case, we just did because that's just who we were. Like it wasn't, it was it was just it wasn't anything different for us. And and maybe because we're rock musicians, we cared less about 
what people thought of us yeah. from the beginning. And, and I think we still don't give much of a shit. <laughs> so, you know. <sighs> Well, I mean, you always being so outspoken <clears throat> about your political views, yeah. at times very controversial political views. Yeah. Did you, did any of your political views ever get you in trouble? Yeah, we have a whole film coming out about this okay. um, that, uh, that we're doing tentatively called Truth to Power. It's a documentary um, <clears throat> that uh, part of which, uh, part of, part of the scenes I've shot over the years myself, but it basically is the interwining of activism and music and how they work together, how they don't work together, how at times one can be lethal to the other, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's actually an interesting concept. But um, there have been many times where my activism has worked against our music, mm. our commercial success. Uh, and But there have also been a lot of times where our activism worked in our favor because it, it gave us respect for always speaking out the truth you know, irrespective of what's going on, irrespective of public opinion, irrespective of what might be popular. Mm -hmm. Well, art shapes culture and society. It instills values. It changes opinions. And you and your band have had um, a tremendous influence all over the world. Uh, so what do you think we could do about some of to have a little bit of a cultural revolution in Armenia right now. Because what I have a problem with is some of the TV programming and some of the music that is really popular there now. I mean, a lot of it is perpetuating all of the domestic violence stereotypes and um, the thug behavior and things that I wish we would kind of Shire steer. Down. Yeah. So what can we do about that? I think if, if, we're, if we were to take this back... Um, I don't think it's something that started now mm -hmm. you know, or recently. This has been going oh, on yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. In fact, what I would what I would contend is that that is already starting to change. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is due to the revolution and new leadership and, and young people being in charge who have shed some of those stereotypical attitudes. But some of it is also the kind of... Uh, yeah, the, the globalization of the country itself and, and the more people go and live there, more expats go and live there, there's more combining of attitudes and not one single attitude dominating. <clears throat> what you're talking about <clears throat> in terms of, uh, in a nice way, it's saying old school, but in a bad way, it's saying there's a lot of, you know, discrimination, there's a yeah. lot of uh, domestic violence, there's, there's a lot of issues that we have to grapple with. Finally, those are being shed into the light. You know, there's organizations that are doing some great work, uh, you know, uh, women's shelter, uh, women's shelters and women's, women's resource center in Armenia is a great organization. But there's a lot of amazing nonprofits and there's a lot of volunteers more than ever before mm -hmm. <clears throat> that are starting to change the way that we think about institutionaliz institutionalization of kids in Armenia, um, uh, you know, uh, kids with disorders. Uh, you know, domestic violence, like all of these things that were kind of protected by the fortress of the family before, yeah. in a way, that are now kind of out in the, out into the light and being dealt with in, in a proper judicial manner. Um, so these are changing. Come, mm -hmm. you know, music as well is changing. You know, there's a lot more kind of, you know, obviously there's still some Rabi's music and there's people that yeah. listen to Rabi's music and that's fine. But there's also a lot of other types of music, uh, mm -hmm. modern type of music, mixing in with Armenian flavors and, and coming out of Armenia, not just the diaspora. Same with art, mm -hmm. you know, um, painting, and same with festivals, food festivals, wine. And, yeah. you know, so look, I would say that if it wasn't for, you know, I've, I've said this, it takes a cultural revolution. Uh, sorry, it takes a cultural evolution to have a... A peaceful revolution mm -hmm. because without that violence is always there you know just biting at the bits to you know to really dominate right. and we would not have had the type of revolution that we had had uh last year which i consider a historical kind of anomaly absolutely you know a gift from the stars if yeah. you will um we would have not had that if we didn't have some type of cultural evolution in understanding that we can do this. In fact, the decentralized civil disobedience by the youth that really 
succeeded the revolution. The original revolutionaries, I mean, you'll see it in the film, I Am Not Alone, that we're working on, documentary mm -hmm. film about the Armenian Revolution. What Nigol and the 12 revolutionaries originally had in mind, step by step, were failures. You know, each act that they did wasn't working. They basically, they were so insistent on going the next level and not accepting defeat that they happened upon almost accidentally civilized, uh, sorry, uh, decentralized civil disobedience mm. where they do an act and post it and people start replicating it. And kids were replicating some of these maneuvers, stopping traffic and, you know, but, you know, breaking the law, but, but in a very gentle way, yeah. <laughs> not hurting anyone, no violence, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And it just spread like wildfire mm -hmm. positively. So I think if, if the youth wasn't in a state of kind of, uh, 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 Charaji you know, yeah. rather than violent confrontation, that wouldn't have happened. And that requires a cultural change, you know. Mm -hmm. You see, I remember when Amirian, the um, minister of culture, previous minister of culture, had resigned. There were kids dancing in the square in front of the yeah. ministry, you know, asking him to resign. That is unique in yeah. a revolution. That doesn't happen with revolutions. You don't see dancing and singing and asking a minister to resign. Uh, these are really important things uh, when it comes to the progression of our culture to talk about that these don't happen in a society that's locked within an old cultural constraint mm -hmm. our culture is changing drastically and fast and some of those stereotypes are changing and will change you know faster than ever before there was a <clears throat> kind of oligarchic paternal mm -hmm. uh class that was kind of saying we're okay with things this way let's you know Change is good, but let's do it slowly. You know, let let the family decide if there's domestic violence. You know, let let the police not step in. There was some, but they were always resistant to the type of change that you know, and 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 they were you know to the type of change that equals equality, equals justice mm -hmm. for anyone, for anything, and uh, that's gone now. You know, that's gone. So I think we're seeing a huge birth of cultural evolution within Armenia. And, and all of these things are rapidly changing. There's still that resistance, you know, from a lot of people that grew up that way. You know, there's going to be a res resistance. There's going to be a clash of cultures, which is yeah. happening now. But luckily, we have a government and we have a kind of, uh, you know, system now that understands that mm -hmm. and is able to work with it to take it to the next level. You were so moved by our Velvet Revolution that you made some comments about Venezuela. And I don't think that they quite um, kind of knew the background <laughs> with where right. you're coming from. So was there a little yeah. bit of a backlash there? Oh, yeah, there was a huge backlash. But, you know, it's just part of what I do. Um, How do you deal with backlash when that hmm. happens? What do you do? You feel like you have to explain yourself or are you just... To a certain point you do. At certain points you leave it alone. you got to kind of just really feel it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... When, uh, just to explain what happened, when uh, uh, the uh, opposition figure that the U.S. is supporting, uh, he, uh, he had stepped in and declared himself president, and there was, you know, the U.S. started sanctioning Venezuela, uh, the Venezuelan people were being hurt because they couldn't get food stuff. You know, their, all, of their, all of Venezuela's U.S. assets have been frozen since, you know, and Venezuela has a bunch of gas stations in the U.S., a bunch of oil refinery, oil business, all this stuff. And because the Trump administration believed, like the Reaganites would, like the Bushes would in the past, that the only way to deal with people they don't like or governments that they don't like is to basically use the Marshall Plan or the Truman Doctrine, which basically says that South America and Central America are the backyard of the United States to do with as we mm -hmm. please. Now, most of us who live in a modern progressive society think of that as pretty fucking backwards. So um, I didn't think that I didn't I didn't really feel that the majority of the people were, you know, uh, you know supporting the uh, opposition figure. Not that Maduro was doing anyone a favor. I think, you mm -hmm. know, was there uh, is there cronyism in, in Venezuela? Is there uh, some is there oppression? Yes, there's all those things. There's no you know, it's not. And none of these parties are great, mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. But what I did not understand is the level of 
uh, disparity, disappointment that the people were living. Mm -hmm. And, and there was that reaction to my statements, basically saying that, look, you know, yeah, my statement was as a U.S. citizen trying to not get the U.S. to invade another country in vain. Mm -hmm. And we know what's happened with invasions by the U.S. in the past, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan. It's just, you know, they don't plan anything. They don't, they, you know, first of all, they have no right to invade another fucking country. But even if they did, they don't plan things properly. They don't know how to help those people or, or do proper nation building. And that's the truth, you know. So I didn't want to see another one of those. And there were people in Venezuela inviting U.S. intervention. And I could not understand for the life of me how, how opposed you can be to your own people to actually bring in a foreign power who's abused your country before. I couldn't understand that psychology. So my kind of mm, statements having to do with Venezuela, the opposition and what taught me a lot of things. And, and you know, there are places where I had to kind of step back and go, okay, I may have gone too far saying this, but then on the other hand, I'm, you know, unapologetic when it comes to the abuses of U.S. foreign policy. And as a U.S. citizen, it's my complete right to tell my government, you know, that, you know, South America and Latin America are not their backyard. Mm. You know, it's not in the interest of the American people to invade any country, whether it be for oil or anything else. So back to Armenia. Yeah. Uh, do you think musical taste is something that could be developed? Do I think musical taste is something that could be developed? Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, you're not born listening to music, you know? Uh, it's the more that you're exposed to in terms of music and art, mm -hmm. the wider your spectrum is, you know, and your library is, you know? And so that develops from actually being open to trying and listening to different forms of music, you know, uh, observing different forms of art uh, and, 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 and all sorts of cultural, you know, uh, necessities. Mm -hmm. So then, okay, let me ask you this. If you were to be offered some sort of a government position in Armenia right now, would you consider taking it? And if so, what would it be? <laughs> Just hypothetically yeah. speaking. No, I look, I, I've thought about this before, but you know, everything that I do, I do from the outside, from my own free independent Sergistan Republic. <laughs> and, and that seems to be working really well in terms of helping Armenia and doing what I yeah. need to do without being, um, you know, without being under any umbrellas. Uh, mm -hmm. I think as an artist, it's hard to be part of a system because you're always a rebel, you know. And you might not agree with everything anyone yeah. has to say. Um, That's a very good point. You know, so, uh, you know, and, and as much as I like working with Armenia and helping, and I'm, I have a lot of different projects in Armenia right now, some on the horizon, some already in uh, production. And, you know, uh, I like doing them without necessarily being part of the government. I, I don't have to be. But at the same time, I have a lot of friends in the government yeah. and I like working with the new Armenian government more than ever before because I feel like they're doing the right thing. They're following the right, you know, their intentions. There's a lot of work to be done and we need a lot of patience to get through the next couple of years mm -hmm. because we are literally rebuilding a nation from scratch in some ways, in some ways. Uh, and that requires some hard work, but their intentions are right. They're making the right moves. They're doing the right thing. Tourism's up employment's up, the minimum wage is up, the number of people getting uh, medical is up, you know, kids zero to 18, which was partial before, it's full now, cancer patients, but there's a lot of work to do. I'd love to see Armenia in an NHS system, national health system, so that everyone's covered one day, you know, maybe mm -hmm. five, 10 years down the road, we can do that if we raise enough funds, enough taxes, etc. Tax payments are up, obviously, because the shadow economy is out into the light now, mm -hmm. you know, um, so the economy is thriving. Technically, Armenia, you know, if you if you dismiss the shadow economy coming into the light, Armenia is one of the largest thriving economies in the world today. Hmm. You know, it's interesting. Um, so I think we're on the right path. Is there more work to be done? Yes. You know, we need more professionals. We need uh, we need more input professionally from the diaspora, not just financially. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, 
in, in terms of a lot of fields, medical and, and transitional public policy and so many different things, I think, that could be helpful to Armenia. But for the first time, Armenia is actually reaching out to that. They're open to that, you know. Um, Do you know how they're reaching out? How exactly they're well, contacting? All the, all the ministries I that I've communicated with have been open to you know, ex exploring, trying different things, talking to different people mm -hmm. from economists uh, to, you know, people with national health care systems to cultural ministries of other mm -hmm. countries. There's the, there's a bigger openness, mm -hmm. you know, because you're kind of almost starting from scratch, not fully, obviously, but you have a, you have the ability to reshape every entity of your government to be the best that it can be. Mm -hmm. And why not take the best examples from other countries? You know, I, I feel like, you know, even if you can't mirror them exactly, but at least, you know, the trajectory to which you can work toward. Mm -hmm. If, for example, Finland has the best educational system, as an example, or South Korea or New Zealand or, you know, or which country New Zealand, for example, is great at films, getting, you know, directors to come in, shoot there and, you know, their whole stipend system and stuff. And, you know, would be great if Armenia works with, you know, and learns from that and brings some of the best aspects of it. Again, not to replace what's going on because there might not be enough funds or whatever, but it's a trajectory to grow though toward mm -hmm. and that openness is there. Yeah. So we do need a lot of input, a lot of professional input, more financing, more investment, and but things are changing. Mm -hmm. How do you think we could encourage more environmental protections? Um, Respect for wildlife, respect for stray animals. Um, cultural. It's a cultural change. Um, you know, in New Zealand, I give New Zealand as an example because I'm a New Zealand resident as well. And mm -hmm. I live there part of the year. It's not something you have to tell people because it's taught in school from a very young age. You know, so mm -hmm. it's basic education yeah. that we are part of the environment. We're an animal. We consider ourselves above other animals. Fine. But we're still an animal. We still need our environment to survive. <laughs> And our planet is our home, and if we damage it, then then we're damaging ourselves. And you know, so it's 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 a it's a basic educational thing that is is put in, and I think that needs to be done in Armenia from a very young age, and you know, and so that by the time they are driving cars, they won't be throwing out a cigarette. I just heard that they they think those fires, twelve hectares or whatever it was that burned in Armenia yesterday or the day before. They think it could be from someone cigarette. throwing out a cigarette because mm -hmm. it's near the road. And, you know, again, this is, you know, it happens here as well. You know, it happens in the United States. I think the U.S. doesn't have enough, you know, as much as you have some of the biggest environmental nonprofits in the United States of America, there's a huge part of the U.S. population that's been misguided by fossil fuel industries into thinking that global, uh, uh, you know, global warming is, is, is questionable. It's not, it's science, you know, it's there, it's real, you know. So I think, you know, again, there's there's a lot of work to be done and it's a cultural change. Being, you know, part of the environment, <laughs> feeling that the environment's part of what you what you do. Almost is a big deal right now. It's a very big deal. It's a very, it's big, a very deal, big concern you know? and I think it would be a disaster I agree. if they didn't stop it. I agree. You know, the government has been doing its own environmental, independent environmental, uh, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, impact report. Mm -hmm. And so the results will be shown soon, etc. But, you know, uh, the activists, uh, you know, in and around Amosar and, and the community in Chermug and, and, and around Amosar is, is very adamant against allowing lithium back in to, you know, open up the gold mine. You know, any type of any type of mining is bad over the mm -hmm. long term, you know, the, the, the short term benefits that it brings to the economy, taxation and employment is no matter how great of a mine it might be. And it might be the best mine in the world as far as environmental impact. It's still going to have a negative yeah. environmental impact. There's no mine that does not have a net negative environmental impact in the world, you know? So what we need to do is encourage ecotourism, uh, and, and other ways of, uh, you know, living within that space, that green space, whether it's, whether it's, uh, at Amusar or whether it's in Stelut, because there's the dangers of Telut reopening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, 
ecotourism, creation of honey, hiking spaces, and, mm -hmm. and lodging, and, and, and all this other stuff. Mining's a big danger in Armenia. They used to give out mining licenses like chiclets yeah. before. Yeah. In, in a corrupt system where where the state coffers weren't even feeling the positive taxation coming to them. Because mm -hmm. you know? someone would make the deal, there would be money exchange, very likely, under the table, and the mine would operate. And we have a lot of mines that need assessment. Mm -hmm. Mines that have employment, like Zankezu. Some of the that's one of the biggest mines in Armenia. And yeah. it is polluting. Yeah. You know? What do you think about this couple billion dollar threat of a lawsuit? It's been there for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, anytime that uh, a corporation threatens to sue a country, I'm not really, I'm not really into it. I, I feel like th these are the dangers of the globalist WTO, World Bank, IMF system. Is when you get yourselves into these kind of deals where you know. I remember years ago, um, an an Indian community in India was trying to reclaim their water source, which mm -hmm. was owned by uh, owned by a company, a multinational, and and they were trying to take over their water. Their their water was literally locked up. They couldn't have access to their water. And uh, <clears throat> and they, they they broke the lock, however you want to phrase that mm -hmm. image, you know, visualize it, and they started using their water and the company sued the government of India for those people using their own fucking water. You know, it's just, it's beyond me how these things can happen. Um, I think it's unfair. And I do, I personally think that Lydian International is full of shit. And they do have rights, they do have a contract with the former government, but I, I believe that there's some type of corruption mm -hmm. in terms of how they attain their license, mining licenses. Their environmental impact assessment reports were not done right from what I have seen mm -hmm. what i've read myself and i have read it myself mm -hmm. um and and compared it and and talked about it with other experts and stuff and i feel like if they try to come after the government of armenia they are going to lose mm -hmm. you know and they're going to lose big um but i hope it doesn't come to that me too but i think the conclusion is that we have to fight it until the, the very end and not let it happen i think look i think that what the government of armenia needs to do right now is they they have to act reasonably in terms of you know how they have to proceed legally and and with all you know legal course uh all legal actions that they have and and that's mm -hmm. what they need to do but as far as armenian citizens and the public i think we should fight this till the end yes mm -hmm. We got into a very intense conversation without having enough coffee, I yeah, think. I so. Agree. so should I make another one? No, I still have mine. You still have yours? Yes, because we we're talking I'm just so much. I'm to drink coffee. Okay. I love the design of your Thank cup. You. This is Gabat coffee. Yep. Okay, so how did you get into the coffee business? This is absolutely delicious. You, you know, coffee is my favorite thing in the world. So. Mine as well. Um, I got into the coffee business. Let's see. I, I, I've loved coffee for a long time and I've always wanted to do something with Armenian coffee because most people Thank you. in the U.S. and, and non-Armenians don't know yeah. what Armenian coffee is. So I thought it would be a fun way of spreading Armenian culture yeah. in a, in, you know, and having a product that, that people have nev may, maybe never tasted before and getting it out there, a unique specialty item. So we started Kavat Coffee um, with a few friends and... Uh, and it's taken off. Um, we launched it late last year in October, and uh, we had a system show that had an after show available with, with the coffee that people enjoyed, which was really nice. Uh, and we launched it with a proper coffee company as partners, and now we're kind of doing our own thing, and we're, we're going to be launching in Armenia soon. Oh, that's awesome. Year, and in other countries soon thereafter next year, I'm assuming. So we're kind of on this growth path. Very slow and, and steady, but uh, but we're enjoying it and uh, people are loving it. And I, I got to say, the majority of our uh, coffee consumers are not even Armenian. 
you know that's amazing um, which is great you yeah know, and that's that's the point do you read their cups <laughs> <laughs> yes each and every one of them online no um <laughs> they but, just send you the pictures online you know, and... we thought about that we thought of doing a, that's a great idea <laughs> where people can upload pictures and someone would read them you know kind uh, of almost community based you know someone would read them someone would upload and we are we're, we're going to get to it but we've got so yeah. many other growth challenges we're dealing with right now, including distribution, yeah. physical distribution, and all, all sorts of stuff. That, but but people really love the coffee, the taste. We have besides our modern Armenian coffee, we have an espresso blend that's doing really well. We're about to introduce decaf as well. Oh, yeah, that's great because people like me can't sleep after. I can't sleep if I drink coffee after like six p.m. Yeah. But I must have coffee Four all day. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. My yeah. mom's like that too. So that's why I developed yeah. the decaf because yeah. I started that's drinking. That's a great really, idea. And and decaf is usually so mm. bland tasting and yeah. watery tasting, and so we we developed something that's really really strong and and so you don't feel like you're missing out on the taste when you're having that decaf. But yeah, it's fully decaf and and organic. Yeah, no, this is absolutely delicious. Um, How do you feel like? Um, being Armenian in Los Angeles, what were some of the advantages in your career? Like, did you experience, um, like, for example, I would just guess that even just having Armenian music and Armenian culture, cultural elements that you can incorporate into your music, I mean, your music was revolutionary. There was nothing like it on the radio at the time. There was nothing like it, period. I think, look, if you're a musician and you're in LA, that's an advantage. You know, because yeah. it's the mecca of music. New York and L.A., as far as the U.S., is, is kind of like the mecca of the entertainment industry. So I think the advantage was there. I think had we started System of a Down in Baltimore or elsewhere yeah. and maybe not be able to play the Roxy first. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe it would have worked out anyway. But I just feel like being in L.A. gave us that advantage because it's, it's the music industry is based there. Sunset Boulevard and yeah. different clubs and stuff where we started I think that was the advantage. Having an Armenian community around and friends, that was also a big advantage. Before we ever played a show, uh, I was renting out this warehouse in North Hollywood years ago where the band had like our rehearsal space. And we also, I, I also had an office there for my little software company and, and a little sleeping space, um, very uncomfortable sleeping space. <laughs> um, and, uh, but we spent a lot of time there with the band and kind of really, you know, like a laboratory you know, putting all the ingredients in, trying things, painting the walls and going crazy and getting drunk and doing whatnot. But it became a place where friends started coming by and seeing mm. us because it was industrial. Yeah. So there were no homes around. We would open the big gate and people would come in and, you know, and just hear us play, hear us rehearse. So by the time we mm. played our first show, we sold enough tickets, more than enough tickets to actually play some of these places as opening bands. That's awesome. And then more people started coming and started building yeah. our database and and i had a very very early website before uh before god yeah a really early website with uh our music our demo music on there yeah um before the internet even exploded like people even knew what the internet was i, yeah. I, had, I had our music on there um so it you know we all did our part and and we built it we worked hard obviously but mm -hmm. there's a there's also a certain amount of right place, right time, luck to it, you know, mm -hmm. I think, because when we first started playing our music, it was so much from the left, you know, in terms of, I don't mean politically, I just, yeah. so much far from anything yeah. that was happening, yeah. that people didn't know what to make of it, I remember record labels going, obviously people really like your music, we're very interested, but we don't know how we could get you on the radio, because radio wasn't playing anything like that, Yeah, radio wasn't playing heavy music at the time, Yeah, you know, they played some industrial music. They played some, I mean, that was the closest thing to heavy, but they, they didn't have heavy music. And then it's so funny because by the time we got signed, by the time we started touring, before we even got on the radio, radio started changing. Yeah. So you can't explain that except for just being in the right place at the right time, being influenced by your surrounding. You know, I think uh, Darren being a great songwriter, I think he also kind of really knew what was going on. You know, there's there's so many aspects mm -hmm. to the sound of of what we did and 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 there we were. What do you consider your big break, your first big break? I guess it was working with Rick Rubin ultimately. How you did know? you get into touch with him? 
Um, so we, uh, we had a show at the Viper Room. Mm -hmm. And uh, our manager at the time, his best friend was close with Rick Rubin. And he was also a manager. And, uh, and so he, he had invited Rick to come and play. Mm. And so we were... So we're excited about having Rick Rubin play because Rick Rubin's an amazing, obviously, record producer that, that everyone yeah. knows and has done so many different types of music. And we were just excited as musicians to have him lis listen to us. He really got it. He understood it. Had a nice chat with him. And I think there were other labels interested in us at the time. And he was doing a new deal with Sony at the time. And ultimately, we couldn't walk away from the concept of having Rick Rubin produce our band because we knew how different we were. Yeah. But we knew that he got it and he could really place it properly, mm -hmm. you know. Um, whereas if you're just dealing with execs, you might not know where you end up, you know. Yeah. So I think that was our, I, I really consider as far as the music industry, that was our big break. And I've, I, I just recently saw Rick to interview him for my own film, my own music. Oh, wow. And uh, so I'm like, <laughs> I know I've thanked you before, but I'm, I don't know if I've ever put it to you in this way. <laughs> Like what you've done for yeah. for my band and myself is is short of a miracle, and and so thank you, bro. You know, um, so I think that was our break. But listen, it took years for System of a Down to gather the type of authentic audience mm -hmm. that we needed to to have any type of radio play or presence. In other words, our first record, people may have heard Sugar later, but mm -hmm. nobody heard Sugar at the time. It was on specialty shows on K Rock, like yeah. Jed the Fish and stuff like that. Um, and uh, but but it wasn't being played on the you know yeah. regularly on the radio. But we 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 toured like you know two three years straight before our wow. second record, and you know we did our videos and singles for our first record, which had a little life here and there, late at nights and whatnot, just enough to be not in the limelight but be mm -hmm. part of the scene. Yeah, you know. But it's 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 during it's all those Ozfests and touring and touring with Slayer that really got us a, a real audience following yeah. a real following on the streets. That's amazing. And that's what broke System of a Down. Yeah. Um, ultimately, so when we had a hit single with you know from our Toxicity record, when it blew up, it wasn't yeah. like we were just some band out of L.A. that we played a few clubs and suddenly we had a song on the radio. We hadn't seen Home. Yeah, we hadn't been home for three years. Oh my god, we were working it every day. Yeah. So people knew who we were because we were out there. Yeah, you know, and so that was the more of the commercial, and that was during nine eleven. So we got a. That's lot That's what of I was just going to ask you about because of that self righteous suicide line. You actually yeah. got a lot of. Third Channel was uh, taking a lot of songs off the air at the time. Anything with the word sky or you know, and let alone a song that had self righteous. So funny enough, on the week of yeah. September eleven. The top Billboard record was our Toxicity record. Wow. Even without a single on there, you know? And we released our record that week, and we were on tour that week, mm -hmm. which was scary as shit. Um, anyway, very interesting times. And, of course, I had a piece called Understanding Oil that I had written trying to understand what had, what had happened with the 9-11 attacks, and, uh, and that had, you know... Uh, death threats and all sorts of stuff because of a time of reactionism in the u.s mm. you know um you know after an attack like mm -hmm. that and if you read it now it's pretty pretty uh plain and simple uh, asking for a multilateral kind of judicial you know, research into what's going on mm -hmm. as well as not supporting people like you know the guy that killed Khashoggi, uh saudis mm -hmm. and, you know some of these people that are tyrants Mubarak and stuff like that. I was talking about U.S. Middle East policy in the last 50 years having an adverse effect on the livelihood of the U.S. citizen. Mm. You know, in other words, let's take, let's let's not look at this as an isolated incident of people killing themselves mm -hmm. to make to to create damage, but let's look at this of why something like this would happen, where those kids grew up, and why they would be in that mentality, mm -hmm. you know, and all of that stuff. And no one was talking about the fact that most of those guys were Saudis, our allies. Mm. You know, it's just, it's just hypocritical. I think, you know, knowledge is power, as they say. And, and I think when you lack it, you're, you're gone, man. You're gone. And, and in a lot of ways, that, that has happened here. Mm -hmm. Did you feel um, adverse effects at that time for being outspoken oh, about yeah. your... I was on the Howard Show defending my statements, my... Uh, 
you know, uh, understanding oil, the piece that I had written, mm -hmm. getting death threats. The band sat me down and they're like, are you fucking crazy? Are you trying to get us killed? Wow. And my, my innocent reaction was, it's the truth. And they're like, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, who cares? Yeah. Um, and, and that was, that was a good point as well. It's like, there's, I think there's a time to say things. And, but with me, I've always, you know, I've always had respect for artists that didn't care about public opinion, mm -hmm. that always said the truth, no matter whether it bit them in the ass or it helped make them big or whatever, because yeah. it's the same, really. The truth doesn't change. Yeah. You know, the truth doesn't change. It's just people's attitudes change. Mm -hmm. Opinions change. Governments change. The truth doesn't change. And if you start not talking about it because it's not pleasant to people and they're not going to buy your records or they're not going to follow you on social media, then you're, you're not an artist. Mm -hmm. You're a commercial salesperson. Darren gave an interview about how you're the reason that there is no new system of a down album. So then you responded and basically um, kind of said that you were looking for for a certain kind of compromise because things had become unfair at a certain point as far as like um, equal publishing split, creative input, and him wanting to be the only one to do interviews and things like that. So do you feel like there could be a compromise eventually? Um, I, think we've all, I think we all see eye to eye and we respect each other as friends and band members, mm -hmm. which is why we tour, which is why we have fun together, we rehearse together, we're in the same space, we crack jokes. We don't have a, you know, our only problem is seeing eye to eye artistically. And that's not a bad thing. Mm. That's what artists are. Mm -hmm. You know, your dad's an amazing painter. Yeah. If he was to have to paint with someone else who yeah. may be one of his best friends. Yeah. Right. But if they were doing a piece together and if, and even though if your dad respected that guy's work mm -hmm. and if they were doing it together, but your dad really wasn't into the piece yeah. and they just couldn't agree on it. That, that's okay. They could still remain friends. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just not agree on the piece. On mm -hmm. doing that. So that's really what happened with us ultimately is, yeah, there were woes of the past mm -hmm. which were aired. And I'm glad they were aired because yeah. it needed to get out, not in public, but amongst us. Mm -hmm. And they were, and that happened. And, you know, so that's fine. The truth is all out there. You can go read it. I don't need to re, 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 uh, yeah. it. but you know, but the important thing is that we've seen, be we've come beyond that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, you know, and, and the question is, will there be another system record? I don't know. I don't know, you know, but the important thing is that, is that we, we are, we are, we enjoy each other and we're mm -hmm. friends. My friendship to Darren and the rest of the guys have always meant more mm -hmm. than system of a down to me. Yeah. Now, not everyone will say that to you, mm -hmm. but I've always said that yeah. because that to me is more important because that's where it started. Yeah. The music was a byproduct of our friendship. Our friendship wasn't a byproduct of our music. Mm -hmm. When I was reading about it, it kind of reminded me of, remember how friends had made that pact that no matter what, when they first start, that they're all going to always fight for equal pay so that everything just kind of like... Yeah is fair between the group. So it kind of reminded me of that where, you know, sometimes I think compromises could yeah. could be made. And yeah, I mean, everyone has a different way of look, yeah. looking at stuff. We're four quite different personalities. Um, and irrespective of being friends and all being Armenian, we're quite different from each other, yeah. all of us, you know? And that's okay. That's good. That's what's made the music great, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it's done that, but at the same time, we're not all the same. We're not always on the same page, and we'll never be, really. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're okay. working on new music now. I am. So I'm what exactly? Yeah, music. exactly. What Barely. are you, What exactly are you working on now? Because I think you were working on another score, um, right? I just finished uh, the score for "I Am Not Alone," which is a documentary that I'm also producing, not just scoring, but I'm also producing mm -hmm. about the revolution in Armenia that I'm very excited about. Yeah. We're taking it to the Toronto Film Festival oh, that's next awesome. month. Um, so we're premiering there, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to seeing the reaction. I'm looking forward to seeing um, what type of distribution we get around the world mm -hmm. because I want as many people to see this film as possible because, yeah. because it's the magic of the revolution. There's a magical key. It's in this film that's really in the revolution, not the film, but, yeah. you know, that will unlock a new way of overthrowing oppressive regimes. 
that hasn't been done in history before, mm -hmm. thanks to the revolution in Armenia. And that makes this film really special. Mm -hmm. um, so I finished the score for that. Uh, the film is being finalized to go to Toronto in September. Um, we are, I'm, I'm currently working on a co-score for a New Zealand film. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also going to be finishing the score on a music film that's like kind of my film yeah. um, called Truth to Power Tentatively. And it's uh, basically, I kind of talked about it earlier. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's basically, uh, how, you know, how does activism work its way through the arts to find its ultimate trajectory? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting, through my life and through my experiences. And, you know, it, a lot of these questions you brought up regarding understanding oil, 9-11, mm -hmm. and how music sometimes works against yeah. activism and vice versa, or together, um, is really dealt well in that film, which is very interesting, I think. Mm -hmm. um, got Kavat Coffee. I've got a bunch of other stuff going on. Um, but I don't need to really talk about everything. If you weren't um, a musician, what career path would you have chosen? Yeah, we asked the Dalai Lama the same thing really? <laughs> years ago. We were on camera with the Dalai Lama yeah. for this film, and uh, Moby asked the question. He was there. There was like three or four of us. And he said, if you weren't the Dalai Lama, what would you be? And he said, something <laughs> having to do with the environment. Hmm. Something having to do with the environment. I don't know. I'm not sure what I would be. Now, my, I have a very... Uh, kind of equally proportioned left and right brain. Yeah. So I could have been a lawyer for all I know, but I, I didn't. I didn't want to go that. Yeah. Obviously decided not to, but I, I could do many things, but it, it has to stay within the arts for me because whether I'm painting next door, scoring here, you know, or, or writing in a notebook or reading or, you know, listening to music, whatever I'm doing, that's what makes me thrive. I do a lot of things that are political, social, nonprofit, mm -hmm. and that... I need as well in my life. But if I don't have a little time with the arts per day, I don't feel right. I, yeah. I don't feel like myself. I need to be embedded in the arts to a certain degree per day yeah. for me to feel like myself. Otherwise, I feel uncomfortable. I don't feel happy, you know? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've always had since childhood? When did you start getting into no. the arts? Um, I actually started playing music in college. Um, I was not interested in music at all. Wow, are you all. serious? Yeah, my parents got me an acoustic guitar um, while I was in junior high or something like that. I was like, eh, gave it to a cousin, no interest. No um, way. I swear, yeah. They tried to get me to take piano lessons. I'm like, nah, doesn't look interesting. Um, you know, okay. I said, I'm too busy with my studies or whatever. Um, I was very studious. I was a 4.0 student and mm. um, I had zero interest in music, zero. Amazing. And then in college, I started University Cal State Northridge. I started majoring in business. Mm -hmm. and I got a little Casio keyboard just as a way of just meditation, you know, yeah. just to get my mind off things. And I liked it so much. I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy a proper keyboard. I bought yeah. another keyboard, started playing that. And then I was like, and then, and then, Mecha <laughs> Unga. That's amazing. <laughs> I fell in it. And I had this, again, part of the film that I'm making, but I had this epiphany uh, one day. Uh, I had graduated university. I was working in the jewelry industry. That's probably why I had the affinity, uh, uh, epiphany. <laughs> um, but I, I knew that I should be doing something different. I just didn't know what it was. Yeah. So I thought maybe I should learn law. And, um, and so I, I signed up for these Kaplan classes so I could take the LSAT, which is the exam that you take if you want to go into um, uh, what do you call law school. But I hated it so much. One night I remember driving back home in the rain. It's, it's like embedded in my mind. I was, I, was, I was so angry. This is after a full day of driving around, work, working from morning till night, then going to these classes and everyone being so happy to get into law. And I fucking hated <laughs> lawyers. And so I remember hitting my brakes in the middle of nowhere hitting my dashboard and going, I don't want to do any of this fucking shit. I want to do music. I, I kind of wow. I had to go to the far reaches of who I shouldn't be to realize who I should be. And after that day, my life changed like this, you know, and everything I worked for, and it didn't change so that I woke up and just did music. Mm -hmm. Life's not that easy. You right. got to pay the price for your dreams. Right. Um, and if you don't, then you won't appreciate your success. You won't appreciate what you do. Um, so I did everything so that I could do more music, you know, fought my way so I could do more music, ran a software company so I had more time to do my own music, you know, did anything and everything so I'd have more time for my art. And 
and and as I had more time and more time, I started, you know, building it, building it, learning and building mm-hmm. it, trying and creating and recording and building it, building it. And at this time is when System Over Down happened. Wow. And so, so how did you start? Did you start just kind of playing as a keyboardist. self-taught? Yeah. So I started as a keyboardist and I my first band was a hybrid Armenian American band that I played keyboards for called mm-hmm. Forever Young. And we had some songs in Armenian and English. Mm-hmm. And um, we have a few funky videos that'll be in the film. And then uh, so from there I met, you know, we were rehe- we were sharing rehearsal spaces with our other Armenian guys in other bands and mm-hmm. became part of this community of musicians. And that's where I met Darren, because uh, the other band had gotten him as their guitarist. And, mm-hmm. and then him and I kind of really connected musically and started. Uh, we worked on a song together uh, when David Koresh had passed, the, uh, you know, had the whole Waco, Texas thing had happened. Mm-hmm. We co-wrote a song uh, with some of the guys in my band at the time, Forever Young. And Darren played on it called Waco Jesus that I sang on. It was the first thing I ever sang on. I wrote lyrics to it as well. And... Um, mm-hmm. So that's when, after that, Darren and, Darren and I started just writing small songs together. We noticed that our voices harmonized well together. And so that's when we started playing. And uh, our first band together was not System of a Down. Mm-hmm. It was Soil, a band called Soil, which lasted for eight months. We had a drummer from Hawaii, Domingo, and our friend uh, Dave Hagopian was our bassist, you know, Dave. Mm-hmm. And, um, Who was then in The Apex Theory, correct. right? Yeah. yeah. And so we had a band for eight months, and that was the incubation period period for what later turned out to be System of a Down music. It was more, it was heavier than System, more progressive than System. Yeah. I mean, the way Shavo described it is there was seven System songs in one Soil song, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really important. We only had one show that we played at a blues club, the Fei Dodo. Yeah. And uh, and that was it. Our drummer had to go back to Hawaii, so we stopped playing as that band, and then hmm. we formed System of a Down. Wow. Yeah. That's so fascinating that you just threw yourself in completely, and you're self-taught. You're a self-taught vocalist, self-taught keyboard. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. How do you do that? You just sit in your room for hours at a time and just... It's the love. That's amazing. It's the love, yeah. yeah. It's the passion that drives the skill. Yeah. And the skill develops over time. Same same with singing, same with everything. Yeah. Um, a lot of huge composers like Hans Zimmer are self-taught. Mm-hmm. They, they never have yeah. composition per se, um, you know. And uh, so that's, yeah. So I write for orchestra, but, you know, I can't read well. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I can read a little now, but uh, enough to get by. But uh, luckily, I have help when I need it for, you know, yeah. tabulation or kind of direction. But it, it helps being from a musical background either way, because music's an intuitive medium. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, if you can connect with other musicians, whether they're studied orchestral musicians or mm-hmm. just a guitar or rock player, if you can connect with them just through your intuitive medium of music and, and tell them what you want, They'll yeah. play that, irrespective of what's written on the yeah. page. So, ultimately, that's what's important. And I'm sure all your discipline with how studious you were actually really helped in that regard, too, probably. I I think with the discipline my, you my had in music. My work ethic and discipline yeah. has always been there, yeah. In your opinion, what are some of Armenia's greatest assets that we just simply aren't taking enough advantage of? It's a really good question. Khoratsar. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> making sense. <laughs> what are some of Armenia's greatest assets that we're not taking advantage of? The diaspora are one of Armenia's greatest assets that until now, now we're starting to take advantage of it. Mm-hmm. But until now, we haven't been able, you know, the government of Armenia has not trusted uh, the relations enough to well because they were robbing and stealing (laughs) anyway whatever in or out camera i don't care but um you know there there was interaction and and they wanted financial help but there was no invitation to come make this is your country as well come Mm -hmm. be a part of it help us rebuild a new armenia together Mm -hmm. there was not that invitation before i think that's different now and i think people are taking up that invite more people are going to armenia and, and starting businesses or being entrepreneurs or Soon enough, hopefully joining the government as well, because I think the new government is open to diaspora and wealth of knowledge and, and what whatnot, I think. Um, that's probably one of the biggest, I would say. Uh, 
I think there's a lot of things in Armenia I think that we are not taking advantage of, though. Um, you know, I think, you know, women are more than 51% of the population. And a lot of the working force is women more and more. And I think that still uh, can grow, mm -hmm. you know, um, in Armenia. And, uh, you know, tech is growing in Armenia. We're starting to take advantage of that. Uh, the Tumo revolution, I call yeah. it. Um, you know, uh, so that's really cool. I think we need to take more advantage of that as well because we are a landlocked country with limited uh, natural resources and and but but amazing minds. You know, I when I went to Armenia with Anthony Bourdain um, on one of his last shows on Parts Unknown on CNN, um, that was what he 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 came away with. He said. Oh, okay. You're you guys are the nerds of this part of the world. That you know, like you're you're the brains that you're able to do this stuff. He he understood that during the Soviet time, you know, a lot of there there was a lot of science, a lot of uh, chemistry, a lot mm -hmm. of you know some some major factories and all sorts of stuff happening in Armenia. A lot of a lot of development, a lot of uh, you know atomic stuff, like all sorts of brainiac shit was happening in Armenia. I think we have that. We've lost some of it because of the, you know, people leaving the country over mm -hmm. the last 25 years. Um, but hopefully we'll get some of it back, the sciences, mm -hmm. and, you know. Um, so, you know, the arts, I think we will be able to get back as well. We've lost some of our best orchestral musicians to orchestras in Europe. Yeah. I've played with a bunch of them, and yeah. there's always an amazing Armenian soloist. I'm like, for the ritis. <laughs> and they're like, Erevanis. I'm like, Kani Like, you're in Austria or, you know or mm. Berlin or something yeah. playing with a big beautiful orchestra yeah. and there's like these incredible Armenian soloists that mm -hmm. used to be in the Armenian National Symphony yeah. Orchestra or whatever you know I think in time you know as the wages go up as we progress as we're able to take care of our people more I think there's going to be more people coming back and that's already happening mm -hmm. the excitement is there for a new Armenia yeah. and and if you haven't gone back since the revolution go back now yeah absolutely uh any one artist that you could collaborate with, who would you most like to collaborate with? How do we turn the cameras? <laughs> <laughs> Misho. I want to collaborate with Misho. <laughs> so, I guess we're done. You guys could get started. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank this you. Awesome. That was awesome. Easy. This is a common problem. The master's gardens are painted with blood, the pigs strums on ten strings, ants need anthills to be productive, self-inflating balls imprison the rioters, taking away their sense of direction, security, empty Tupperware, sit atop art books, ready to transport, track 15 may make you crazy. Uh, but it's a passion for the Yeah. In the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Passion and, and the hard working ethic. Passion is a good thing. It's 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 Namaga Kurum Inchen Uzumanel, Yankum. Yeah. Passion. Passion in Arten Kiden. Just freedom. Ede, you know, Hedakir Kira, yet a poker dare kids are ten Haskanas co passionate incha. I I found that out in, in college, yeah. you know, by, by luck, by accident. But yeah. I wish I knew. Well, it doesn't matter. This is my life. I'm thankful that the, yeah, the way yeah. it came out. But it's interesting. These new schools are like that. They're teaching passion based learning. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. But it's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So
ասում է ձայներ, դարիս է խապում, որ ավել անում, ես է դուրը պակել եմ, է դուրը պակել եմ, ես համացայն վեր, որ էդ կվերանա, եվ ես հեղանարմ, ես դա անդունել, ու ձևը կտել եմ, դրսում